media, people getting censored, the people getting a uh, shadow hide, the shadow banned. And uh, Dorsey, the ex uh, CEO of uh, Twitter, yeah, yeah he was building, he's still building. Uh, the centralized network is a, is a content uh, uh, distribution network, a CDN. Because the problem he had with Twitter, people, government would go to him and say, you need to remove this content. And he had to comply. But if the content is in the network that he doesn't manage, doesn't control because it's a peer-to-peer, it's distributed, he says, look, my software is only the interface to see the content. I have no power over the content. You cannot ask me to remove the content, right? You can choose what you want to see or what not, but you cannot choose what is there. So this is uh, the free, the real freedom of uh, information, right? The real democracy of information with the danger that this includes because once you don't control, you're gonna find any sort of things there. I had an issue with an apartment uh, that uh, they don't want to return the deposit because they're claiming some stuff that is not true. And I wrote this angry email. We're full of insults, you know, I'm between the line and stuff because I'm still a polite person, but it was very bad. And before sending it, I took ChatGPT. And I said to GPT, look, I had rented this apartment. I left this amount of money. They are going to keep with silly excuse. They wrote me this email. I reply like this. And ChatGPT says, Roberto, I understand you're upset. <laughs> Maybe it's better to try a more diplomatic way. Why don't you write an email? And he wrote an email for me. How it should be very intelligently correct, because what I was doing was going to be wrong. He said, and then go to a lawyer because Chajiviti is also mean in the other way, right? I just venting out my anger and it will finish there. Chajiviti says, no, be polite to go to a lawyer because you could not win. In every technology that comes right. around, there's potential for good and bad. Do you think decentralization is more evil or more good? Break. I, I absolutely agree. Before spending money, do the correct market research, which can be done with a MVP, a minimum value product, so the minimum things that work uh, to be shown to friend uh, and uh, and and build as you go. I like the idea that Google started with an empty page and a bar in the middle, and then uh, things grew from there, right? Absolutely, yeah. yes. A cli- the worst client, unfortunately, just walk away and don't tell you anything. You know. You think they're not bothering you, they're giving a good day, but the, the reality is they're leaving you in trouble, right? The client that takes the time to get back to your complaint, even if he's upset, uh, is giving you a huge favor. It's, it's a free consultancy, right? <laughs> There's somebody they need to be listening. Uh, because for one, they come back you, uh, to your complaint, there are 20, if not 100, uh, they just walk away. Hey guys, welcome to the Boardroom Podcast. Today we are joined with an excellent guest from Apple. Nonetheless, we are joined with Roberto Capodici. Is that correct? Is that how I pronounce that word? Capodici. Roberto Capodici, yes, almost perfect. Roberto Capodici. Are you from Italy or is just your sister family that's from Italy? How, how does this go? I am. I was born and raised in Italy. Then I spent twelve years in the United States, and now is uh, about twenty years. I'm Southeast Asia, so like a little mm. bit everywhere. Interesting. Where in Italy are you from? Venice. Oh, yeah, from it's Venice? a touristic touristic destination. It was a touristic destination in Florida, in the United States, and in Bali, Indonesia. Now another touristic destination. So if people go there for a vacation, why not to move there and live there, right? So that's. <laughs> <laughs> So you're living the dream. Uh, thank you for sharing. We have a tradition on the Boardroom Podcast that whenever we have a guest on, I think this question is going to fit you nicely. We'd like to ask them, where is your favorite city in the entire world? All right. That's a good question. It, it always depends for what, right? Uh, to do business, yeah. or to chill and relax. I think Singapore is a fantastic state city. It's clean. There is a good energy. There is uh, tons of opportunity with the business. Uh, the government is really ahead into promoting uh, new tech. Uh, so, and lately, I mean, to say 20 years ago, they were quite gray and cold. And now they open with a lot of art uh, activities. So it's very colorful and pleasant to be there. Hmm. 
But depends again if people like history. I think Florence is the most beautiful city in the world. <laughs> but really? uh, you know, I wouldn't live in Italy for a lot of a uh, reason, like uh, government uh, taxations and difficulties in the business. Tax, yeah? But <laughs> yeah, it's, but yeah, I, I think uh, there are several beautiful city. It all has to fit to the person and the reason to be there. Okay, so let's say that you and I are in Singapore. We're having a talk, we're talking business, talking about this upcoming tech boom in Singapore and the potential for it to shake up the world, mind you. And I see one of my friends approaching. So while you and I are talking, my friend is approaching and I say to you, you know, I want you to meet my friend. And I say to my friend, friend, this is Roberto. Roberto, this is friend. When my friend meets you at this time, who exactly is Roberto Capiodeci that he's meeting? A very um, happy and smiley person that welcomes uh, the fact that uh, new people will be... And this actually what you describe is so, so common in Singapore, uh, where networking is the key of every sort of uh, life activity. So I like to... I like a very nice sense of humor. I like to crack jokes, even when I'm talking about serious stuff. And not everybody appreciates that, actually. But uh, I like to listen a lot what people have to share, because that's where you become wealthier in terms of uh, knowledge. And I like to share my insight on the topic that we're discussing. I think uh, most of the time I leave a good impression. I hope so, at least. <laughs> <laughs> so you're a very happy person, very cheerful, very positive outlook on life, despite what everybody is seeing. And you also like to not only have fun, but you like to get down and dirty in terms of getting serious about work. But even when you're serious about work, you're still not a uh, grooming not a fun person to be around. So people like your company is what I'm hearing. Yeah, I think it's important to enjoy life in every moment. So why not? If the same uh, things can be accomplished uh, seriously with a long face or happily and cracking a laugh, you know, why choose one yeah. rather than the other? So yeah, I, I like to enjoy what I do and uh, put a little bit of, uh, you know, spicy condiments on it. <laughs> if not. There we go. I love the way that sounds. The thing that we... Um, that we're really here to discuss is something that's quite interesting as it pertains to getting word done, mind you. We are going to be talking about what it takes to take a product to market successfully. Now, for those of us who don't know, you have worked at, at Apple. You are multiple times best-selling author. You know your stuff and people trust you to be an authoritative voice. So I'm going to pose this question right away. Product success, what exactly determines that a product actually goes to market successfully? And what might you say are some of the reasons that oftentimes a great product goes to market and it flops, as you might put it? Oh, there are millions of, of factors, but uh, for sure, in my opinion, uh, for a product uh, to succeed uh, uh, depends on the on the level. If you're selling worldwide, if you have a certain marketing approach, or if you're selling locally, or if you're selling to a niche, uh, when uh, your target audience uh, is engaged in uh, what you are trying to provide them, you always have an easy way to go. But you also is a double sided thing. In the moment that you ruin the reputation, you're done very fast, right? When oh. you're more generalistic, you need more power to go out. You need uh, more work to get people engaged, but you're more stable in the market once you reach a certain level. So in, in my opinion, engagement, uh, attention toward what you are proposing is, uh, is the key, is the key element, right? Uh, if you look at uh, the approach of Tesla, Elon Musk, or Apple, or Steve Jobs with uh, with his, uh, his product, uh, how they bring the item. People want it even if they don't know how it works, even if they don't know the specifics, because it becomes a, a status symbol, becomes a, like an ideology rather than, uh, you know, belonging to something. Rather, when you go on the other side, you are hitting more the niche of a certain people with a certain passion that uh, you create something specifically for them and the rest of the world doesn't care. But some niche are huge and, and allow a big yeah. success in the market. So do you prefer to try to go very specific at first and then you go general? 
or do you try to go general because that's where the money is made? No, I think that being uh, when you start small, uh, mm-hmm. depends also there. You start online, you start locally. If you open uh, like a flower shop in a town, then uh, you need to become friend of the key people in the town, you know, like so that they can spread the word and you get your local client. If you open a service online, then you need to promote online. Then if you do a service online, you better go toward the very specific niche because uh, it's easier to target a niche with the correct wording that the niche understand, with the correct service or product that the niche need. And uh, it's easier to arrive to client. The word of mouth inside the niche goes much faster. So if you provide a good quality product or service, you spread along the niche and you can reach worldwide audiences, which when a niche is localized in a city, maybe it's a bunch of people. But when the same niche is spread worldwide, you become a huge quantity of people. So that's a yeah. very big power. I tend to agree with you. And the thing that we also need to remember is if you try to generalize, this is this is the catch about generalization. Even though there's a lot more to earn from generalizing in terms of all right, you're selling cars or the like, if you try to generalize too quickly, your marketing message becomes diluted. And what does that mean? You remember you said that if you speak to the niche, you can use certain words that is familiar to that niche and so on. It's kind of like that. You're not speaking to any specific person. You end up not speaking to anyone because there's so much more competition when you generalize, right? So I tend to agree with you. Are you familiar with um, Malcolm Gladwell's book, uh, The Tipping Point? The Tipping Point, yes, absolutely. Uh, that, it is absolutely a, a good referral in the in the specific yeah. right. Yes, absolutely, yes. Definitely. And there's also Seth Godin's um, This is Marketing and Purple Call. Those are two very good books as well. And, and, and it is also something that yeah, is true everybody can learn, but there is people that has more this gift in understanding. You know, sometimes even without studying it, you guess it and you guess it right. When mm-hmm. somebody else has to really follow a protocol, then you better study very well and trust the people that give them uh, the, the consultancy or the suggestion. I saw uh, it, it, it is beautiful. Like uh, sometimes people say, OK, get me completely naked, drop me in a country where I don't speak the language. Give me a week. I'm going to already start the business and make money. Right. Because is in the mm-hmm. blood of these people, the ability to understand how to connect uh, uh, need with supply of the need, right? Yeah. And the proxy in the middle. And, and, and channeling this uh, is always uh, the mechanics that is the, the biggest winner when you don't have capital, you don't have a big uh, uh, funding to create something, right? But the biggest mistake uh, is to judge your own self in thinking that this is the right thing or the wrong thing. And then uh, investing a lot on that and then discovering that the market doesn't care at all about what you are proposing. So it, it is important yeah. to invest little, move on, get feedback uh, and be ready to pivot. I have a very, very interesting uh, analogy, but it's, it's actually a true fact. My wife uh, has a small factory that does product for spa. Okay. And she was mm-hmm. so proud of this one particular product, which is a candle that is not made of wax that can be used to do massage. It's fantastic. Nobody could understand that. She was making soap that was just a by side product. Everybody went nuts for the soap. And now she's reverting. That's the first thing that she sells. But she wouldn't know unless she confronted the market, right? Making the mistake of believing that her product in her mind was the best. And she made a lot of them and started piling up on the back when everybody wanted what she thought was not so a big deal. So sometimes we don't understand the market until we... We put our hands in it, right? And it's better to do that with the minimum investment as possible because uh, every mistake can be expensive, right? So what are some of the things that we can do, some of the steps that we can take to ensure that whenever we're taking a product to market, it is the actual product that the market wants at the price that they want? 
Well, uh, MVP, uh, I say I've been working on software, right? So um, my mother, uh, late mother, she was the best tester for it because I put her in front of a computer. She has no idea how to use a computer to start with, right? So if she was able to do something out of it, I know I was on the right way. And uh, confronting an idea with friends, uh, but real friends, and not those that tell you, oh, amazing, even if they think it's uh, bad, you know? Honest, <laughs> Honest people yeah. that can really tell you, this is a, no, this is a silly idea, it's not going to work. Uh, and uh, going through all this uh, treatment of being bombarded, of being attacked until you're in tears because you think they're, they're trying to destroy you, this is actually a constructive process. Because if you get alive out of one of these, means that you probably have something good in your hand. So you need to connect with um, potential customers of your product before you even make it, just to Absolutely. present something to them, to ask them if this is something that they would want. Absolutely. Basically. The first feedbacks you have from honest people, honest people, that's the most important thing, are the best, right? Yeah, so that's why when, so you, when somebody becomes a little bit important, the people is afraid to give them honest feedback because they're, they're afraid to offend the person. This person mm -hmm. is more in trouble, you know. If somebody is more humble and friends and family and, um, you know, friends of friends are don't have any problem, just straight say to this person, this is stupid, you know. Like, <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and, and people is listening, don't get offended, you know, open-minded to understand that probably you're doing the wrong thing. You, they are saving you a lot of money and a lot of uh, disappointment. Right. The thing that I'm about to ask you is that doesn't that mean that when you have um, like customers giving you feedback on your product or you get an angry customer and saying that, you know what, this is what I hate about your company or your business or your service or your product. Doesn't that mean that it's those people? were the most important? Absolutely, uh, yes. A the worst client, unfortunately, just walk away and don't tell you anything. You know, they, you think they're not bothering you. They're giving a good day. But then the reality is they're leaving you in trouble, right? The client that takes the time to get back to your complaint, even if he's upset, uh, is giving you a huge favor. It's, it's a free consultancy, right? <laughs> There's somebody they need to be listening. Uh, because for one, they come back you, uh, to your complaint. There are 20, if not 100, uh, they just walk away. And talk to other people bad about your product and your company, <laughs> which is even worse, right? So, you know, the, the classic say this, if you like it, tell other. If you don't like it, tell us. You know, that's, uh, that's really the key of the mechanics. Right? I agree with you because, you know, the thing that is most interesting about how businesses tend to fail, a lot of times it's like you said with your wife, you, you personally, as the business owner, the startup owner, you have a problem and you have a solution for that problem. And you say, ah, a lot more people must have this problem. Therefore, my solution must help. And you've incorrectly made the assumption that your solution is the best way to go about solving that problem. The other thing that you also do is you're making an assumption about how much they're willing to pay for your product, which oftentimes it's wildly overpriced and out of pocket because, you know, you're emotionally, emotionally attached to it and you think it's the best thing in sliced bread. I like the idea presented by Eric Reyes in um, The Lean Startup, where he says that you get the minimum viable product, you get it out there in its ugly state, incomplete state, you get a few users, and after you get your users, then you say to them that this is what we're working on. What do you think? What will you change? You keep on iterating based on feedback from actual users of your product or service until eventually you get to product market fit. So what are your thoughts on that um, lean startup process by Eric Reyes, really? Yeah, I, I've been through the process. I've been mentoring startups as well. And, uh, you know, there is a certain level for which uh, people think constantly is okay, breaking and rebuilding is okay. But uh, he has to arrive to a certain point that there must be a, a common thread on what people want to do, right? So that there is a limit on how much you want to pivot and change because it means that you're not just a, a ball in a flipper that is bouncing everywhere, wherever there is a little bit of money opportunity. It's true that the, 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 all the startup scene, unfortunately, is built around investors. It is built for investors to put money and do a good exit. Sometimes they don't really care about the product. <laughs> they don't really care about the long life of the startup. 
So people that ends up in the world need to pay a lot of attention on how they're bounced around because sometimes the suggestions that they receive are just for the interest of the investor, not for the interest of the product or the project that they have. Um, so it is okay, break. I, I absolutely agree before spending money, do the correct market research, which can be done with a MVP, a minimum value products, so or the minimum things that work uh, to be shown to friend uh, and, uh, and, and build as you go. I like the idea that Google started with an empty page and a bar in the middle, and then yeah. uh, things grew from there, right? Uh, mostly yeah. behind the scene and then in front of the view of the person. Uh, so this is an approach that I, that I like. But there must be still a fixed point in all this, because if uh, we lose that, then it's, it's ridiculous. You're right. You don't want to, you don't want to be changing everything every time. You want yeah, to at correct. least have an idea of the core value, the core offer, the core product that you're going to be building, and then iterate around that. I want to take a look at AI and decentral decentralization, if I can speak properly, <laughs> and disruptive technology in the world of business. What are your experiences in this field, really? Yeah, all the emerging technology has been very fun in the past uh, decade. How every year was the year of something. Like uh, we've been last year in the year of AI. Year before was the year of uh, this and that. Then uh, the pandemic brought all this uh, uh, remote work uh, and communication and so on and so forth. What is true that there is, uh, so besides all these bubbles that come up and pop and people invest a silly amount of money in scams and browsers that don't go anywhere. So beside those bubbles, there is an underlying direction where the evolution of information technology is going, right? So it's interesting to analyze and see what hides underneath all these, uh, you know, set of waves uh, that move around. And there are some interesting common point. Uh, artificial intelligence uh, is a study that goes for more than 30, 50 years uh, back in time, right? It has emerged now for a set of reasons. Uh, decentralization is, uh, beside the conceptual technique for uh, the army back thousands of years ago, but uh, the mechanics applied to the technology is something they also have a long history. Uh, obviously, Bitcoin, because it's financial, brought a lot of attention. And I need to say sometimes blockchain is famous because it was attached to somebody that has to do with value money. If uh, blockchain was invented for a uh, software for hairdressers, probably nobody will know blockchain today, right? It's because it had their attention. But there are a lot of instruments and a lot of evolution in information era. We start moving from analog to digital, then we start sending digital through uh, telecommunication, then the services are being bought and purchased online. And at the beginning, it was decentralized in a certain way. Every office had a mail server. And then uh, this big company come and offer email for everybody and email become a centralized thing. Everybody has a Gmail. Everybody had a Hotmail or Outlook.com. So just a few actors manage uh, the whole mail of the world, which is wrong. <laughs> and we need to do, go back to decentralize a lot of service with a technology that now is very mature. Uh, they think that the biggest uh, magic the blockchain has brought to, to the information here, to information is uh, the singularity of a digital asset. If before mm -hmm. I make 10 copies of an MP3 file, I don't even know which is the original. I distribute to 10 friends, I have 10 copies, but I cannot make a copy of my Bitcoin and give you the copy of the Bitcoin because that Bitcoin will worth zero. So yeah. when you have a, a digital asset that can be a monkey, whatever it is, in an NFT, and I can say this is unique and I give it to somebody else, I don't have it anymore is a revolution in the world uh, of uh, digital information, right? So I can put the title of ownership of my car in this system. I couldn't do it before because if it's just a piece of paper, I make photocopies, finish. So I need the central authority to say, now this car belonged to Roberto and now it's sold to this other person. In this way, we remove the middleman. We remove the need to trust a third party in saying who's the owner of the car. Because with this technology, I can decentralize uh, the management of ownership of a car, right? I think oh. that the money spent in those silly JPEG of monkeys are silly. It doesn't make sense. It was a bubble. People got dead to it. There has been a lot of money laundered onto it. But uh, the technology, the underlying technology is important. It's important in many sectors. I can do the warranty. I buy a very expensive jacket or watch. 
the warranty can be in an NFT format. So it can follow me, doesn't degrade, I can call it up anytime I want. There are a lot, a lot of use cases that are very important in a decentralized network and a lot of service need to go in that direction as well. So there are a lot of examples uh, that uh, are, are interesting and important. Think social media, people getting censored, the people getting a shadow hide, a shadow banned. And uh, Dorsey, the ex CEO of uh, Twitter, yeah, he was building, he's still building. Uh, the centralized network is a, is a content uh, uh, distribution network, a CDN. Because the problem he had with Twitter, people, government would go to him and say, you need to remove this content. And he had to comply. But if the content yeah. is in the network that he doesn't manage, doesn't control because it's a peer to peer, it's distributed. He says, look, my software is only the interface to see the content. I have no power over the content. You cannot ask me to remove the content, right? You can choose what you want to see or what not, but you cannot choose what is there. So this is uh, the free, the real freedom of uh, information, right? The real democracy of information with the danger that this includes because once you don't control, you're going to find any sort of things there. But the paradigm must to shift from what you allow people to post on the other side, what people want to see or not. And then you can go the, and get the criminal that is consuming content that is illegal rather than not. But the, the paradigm has to shift on the other side, but not on, on the contribution, but in the consumption. Of but the, doesn't that make decentralization the enemy of the government and the state? Because then at this stage, the government can't control what you uh, do or say or post or information that is disseminated. I mean, <laughs> this I, might get the episode. But you know what? Down. Who can control technology, right? It's a piece of software. The piece of software is not listening to the government it's telling, hey, you're illegal, don't run. No, no, no. I don't mean to control the software. I mean to use the software to control the people. That's what hey, I but mean. The, the, the paradigm is to change in this sense. Think uh, about when the first movie, uh, you know, copyright violation of music and movie were done uh, with Kaza and other things. Those were centralized server. Law enforcement can get to these people. <laughs> shut down the server as the people when BitTorrent came out they had to change the the regulations because you cannot stop BitTorrent from existing it's simply there is no a central server a peer-to-peer -peer network is a network computer where there is no one leader one central point of a failure of authority in the network every computer in the network is powerful as much as all the others so you can shut down three and five more comes out in another place. So it's impossible to shut down a peer-to-peer -peer network. So and it's impossible that all the law enforcement in all the planet do a coordinated operation to shut down all the servers that there are in every country of the world. It would be yeah. an achievement in terms of uh, law enforcement coordination, which is impossible. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> so I would be surprised to see that actually. So you need to regulate. You can say you cannot access this, you know, more than... Uh, it cannot exist, right? So, mm -hmm. so it's an interesting uh, thing that uh, has to change uh, culturally as well in how we work with these things. Right? But I want to get your honest opinion on this then, because I understand, before I ask her, I'm understanding that centralization means that one company or a few companies control and own your data and stuff like that. They have control over what's put out there and who sees it and everything like that. Meanwhile, decentralization you're the one responsible for your own data. You do not prevent someone from posting something. And by you, I mean the government, the owner of a company, you, the user of the platform, can prevent someone from posting something. But you can try to alter or filter what you see. Is that correct? Yeah, that's the paradigm. Correct. So here's my question. We know about some very dark things that happen around the world, slavery, um, human trafficking, prostitution. Can I even say that I on YouTube? Yes. <laughs> I might have to um, bring that out, but what, in every technology that comes right. around, there's potential for good and bad. Do you think decentralization is more evil or more good? From your it's, more, it's more good, obviously. And, uh, and again, it's just the technology. It's what people do with it that is bad, and not the technology itself, right? And obviously, a crime remains a crime. It's not that uh, it's no more a crime because the technology allows it, right? So uh, you can, uh, 
forbid all the guns that nobody owns a gun, but if I want to kill somebody, I will find another me. I run with my car on top of that. You can now forbid all the cars from existing <laughs> because they're used, you know what I mean? So the technology is technology. It doesn't do anything if it's not used. How people used, and if somebody used it in a criminal way, this person needs to be arrested, you know, localized, found and arrested. I'm not saying that uh, it shouldn't happen, right? But uh, the mechanics of how things are produced and consumed changes, meaning that uh, is, it becomes uh, uh, a different approach. Uh, think about uh, drugs, for example. Yeah. Uh, many countries make illegal the sales of it, but not the consumption of it. In a strange paradigm, because how can you consume it if you cannot buy it anywhere, right? <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah. let's say in, in Italy, it's like this, it's, it's, it's okay, it's not illegal to use it, is illegal to sell it or to own a huge quantity, a big quantity. So the other places is uh, uh, illegal to use it and it's less persecuted the sales because it's not considered that the aspect that is bad, but the aspect that is bad is the use. So it's two different approaches to the identical problem, you know. Which one works, which one doesn't work, but each, each country must have its own opinion. But when the mechanics shift to what happened in the middle, uh, then, uh, you know, people need to adapt to the new way that things are working, how they're working, I, I believe. I mean, it's not something that we can prevent anyway. So that's how it's going to be, <laughs> if we like it or not. That's true. And also the potential for um, positive use is there. Wouldn't a really good use case be, um, I'm so afraid to put this out there because I feel like I might say it and someone is like, ah, business idea. And they start a billion dollar company from one more <laughs> But I'm going to put it out there. Isn't this something that would be good to use to keep track of company records and finances and so on? Absolutely, yes. Right. You think that one of the first use cases for blockchain that is not cryptocurrencies is the supply chain. So there mm. where there are multiple parties working together, maybe even in different countries with different legislation, different paperwork system, different languages, you need something to... Uh, to be trusted by all of the people in the in the supply chain to verify and control things, which is impossible. Who is going to put all the people in the supply chain of uh, building a toy rather than a coffee from the field to the restaurant or whatever else to agree to subscribe rule book with lawyers and all because company X in country Y is the one that uh, verify and control all the data, all the process, right? But mm -hmm. with the decentralized manner where you don't have to elect a third party and people can freely participate in it, uh, and you set the rules on how the data should be processed, uh, that's, that's the transparency and the guarantee that nobody is cheating, at least on the data that is saved, you know, what happened outside yeah. of the blockchain. So there where there are aspects uh, where multiple parties have to manage just something in common and guarantee each other of uh, the quality of the information, when it has been done and so on and so forth, then uh, that, that this technology is the only one that can come and provide the solution. If you think about it, uh, time stamping, right? So classical things, when somebody is kidnapped to give a proof of life, you take a picture with the newspaper of uh, the last day. So at this day, this person was alive, but you cannot prove it on the other way. I can take a picture of with a newspaper from 50 years ago. I'm not proving that this happened 50 years ago because I can just find the newspaper is 50 years old. The blockchain creates a unique way to prove time with uh, an error of seconds or just a few minutes. So uh, the capacity to identify that some fact has been done at a certain point in time is essential, right? Like invoicing, what you were suggesting. In Italy, all the company, when it was coming to December, were preparing all the invoice for all the year just to even out all the taxation and things, right? Now they introduce yeah. electronic invoicing. So in the moment of the payment, there must be an invoice in the period of time. So you can now anymore, you know, redact your accounting at the end of the year. If this mechanics is managed centralized by the government, but it could be perfectly done in a decentralized manner between uh, all the parties that need to verify these sorts of things. I'm listening and I'm hearing so many things. <laughs> I have to ask you, what is it that is preventing us? Or why is, what is the reason or reasons why decentralization hasn't been at the forefront of company strategies, of business strategies to move forward? Is it because much of 
the bigger players profit from owning your data? Well, there is that aspect uh, for sure. But there is another strange uh, aspect uh, of uh, chicken and egg uh, sort of things. Think uh, something that favor multiple parties uh, cannot be organized by a single company because as we end up to the point of centralizing. So if there is the supply chain of uh, the coffee they involve uh, from the farmer to the producer to the end of the line, one of these people starts saying, okay, I set up the system for all of us to participate. Then people need to trust him. If it's decentralized, he has to be born and grow by all of the party that participate, which is very difficult to, to organize and coordinate. While a single company can offer service to all of the others, which is easy, for all the, the others to participate in a common initiative, then you need a consortium. So when there is a consortium, it's easy to make a decision to create a decentralized system to manage information sharing and flow processes, documentation management inside the consortium because there is a central point that can take a decision for it and invest in it, right? So this is the most difficult aspect. If you think a Bitcoin has been done by some people for the rest of the world and people was free to participate, that's why it grew decentralized, right? When you go and see other projects, uh, they cannot be owned by a company, the profit out of it. You know, it's very difficult to then uh, say, no, but it belongs to everybody. But I made it and I make money out of it, but everybody can use it, but I make money. It's a very strange mechanics. So this is a cultural shift that has to happen. There must be a lot of uh, public uh, uh, basic platform on which people can build this thing for other users. So it's going to take time. And technology-wise, we are in this only in the last 10, 15 years. So we have a long road ahead. I'm thinking, and I want to share a story with you, and then you can comment on it. I used to like Facebook. I had a ton of friends. I used to go on every day, had a good time. And I really hate Facebook now. I hate Facebook so much that... I don't even use it to market my business anymore. And why is that? When Facebook has your data and it's been proven by whistleblowers, by statistics, by news um, outlets and so on, they use it for nefarious means. And not only do they use it for nefarious means, but they also, they try to filter what you see. So if there's something that is going to cause outrage or disgust or negative emotions, they are more likely to make, to let you see that versus something that's going to inform you about your health that's going bad or spread happiness, whatever the case might be. That's the, that's the situation. I can't imagine that I'm the only person that doesn't use Facebook for these reasons. Isn't it then an opportunity? Because if the businesses aren't going to do it, then the consumers should do it. Isn't it then an opportunity for the consumers to have a grievance like this and recreate these platforms in a manner that more befits their liking in terms of privacy, data management, and stuff like that? Or is it that decentralization, using AI, accessing and using the blockchain, leveraging its, well, let's say its um, advantages, is a lot more difficult at this stage, much like when the internet first came around and building a website wasn't as simple as drag and drop, and you're there. Is, is that what we're at right now? Well, the, the reasons are a little bit different. So first of all, I agree of the fact that uh, Facebook is evil. And uh, I mean, it's being clearly proven. But uh, the value of something like this is the quantity of users that are in. For example, there is a decentralized alternative to Facebook. It's called Mastodon. And a lot of people use it, but not so a lot. I create an account. I must have one connection at all compared to the thousands of Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, if you think, uh, for example, people that has both WhatsApp and Telegram, there is no discussion that Telegram is technologically 20 years ahead compared to WhatsApp that has all the issues in the planet. And you would think that a company that has billions of dollars of budget, it will be able to build a piece of software that work, right? And they work yeah. well. But no. But the value of WhatsApp is not the technology that they have, unfortunately, but the user base that they have. 
And wow. you like it or not, if you want to stay connected with the, uh, the teacher for the school class of your kids, uh, with uh, the mechanics that has your cart and is going to tell you it's fixed or not, uh, uh, with whatever else, uh, either you have WhatsApp or you don't communicate with them. If you know, if you want to reconnect with somebody that you don't see for many years and you're searching for them, if you go to Facebook, you're going to find them. If you go to Mastodon, you're never going to find them, right? Because they don't even know you exist. So the, the centralization wins uh, because they have the masses. As soon as the masses migrate out of it towards something else, then, so it's not really important because the common user has no idea what there is behind the technology they use. It's funny enough, the other day I was asking a kid, so there is internet connection here? He says, no. And then I see he's using Facebook in his cell phone. He says, well, there is internet connection You're using Facebook. No, no, this is Facebook. It's no internet. Oh. <laughs> like when, <laughs> he has no idea that to use Facebook, you need to be connected via internet, which is beautiful in a way, if you think, because it's none of his business how the phone is doing it. He's just doing it. He, he's, he's using the effect of it, not the technology behind. So mm -hmm. the people use a decentralized solution rather than a centralized solution. They don't even know. They will go where it's convenient, where they find exactly when a news feed is showing you what you what triggers you, so it keep you connected and attached to it. And now, what if you think Facebook is dangerous, think ChatGPT. Now, I'm fascinated by artificial intelligence. They are reaching AGI, and there is people that is addicted. There is already people in clinics to get the talks from <laughs> artificial intelligence. And I, and I wonder, because you have a conversation, you have a conversation and helps you in important decision in life. I myself am, you know, a little bit uh, victim of that. Like I had an issue with an apartment uh, that uh, they don't want to return the deposit because they're claiming some stuff that is not true. And I wrote this angry email. We're full of insults, you know, I'm between the line insults because I'm still a polite person, but it was very bad. And before okay. sending it, I took ChatGPT. And I said to GPT, look, I had rented this apartment. I left this amount of money. They are want to keep with silly excuse. They wrote me this email. I reply like this. And ChatGPT says, Roberto, I understand you're upset. <laughs> Maybe it's better to try a more diplomatic way. Why don't you write an email? And you wrote an email for me. How it yeah. should be very intelligently correct because what I was doing was going to be wrong. And said, and then go to a lawyer because <laughs> it is also mean <laughs> in the other way, right? <laughs> I just venting out my anger and it will finish yeah. that. Just says, no, be polite, I go to a lawyer because okay. you're going to win. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, ChatGPT is centralized. ChatGPT has been shown very well that it's been trained with a political direction. And yes. uh, that needs to be decentralized. Then I want to use an artificial intelligence that is in a peer-to-peer -peer network with millions of nodes around the world where the synapses of his brain are physical between the nodes of the peer-to-peer -peer network. And I'm working for this thing because that's the real democratic. Uh, then if I don't want to hear or see something, from the artificial intelligence, I filter what I want to receive because something that is strained like this is going to contain everything. <laughs> you know, you cannot control what is uh, artificial intelligence learn and what not. While it's funny because it's entered a complete new planet that is interaction with the machine through a conversation. And when hacker in the past were just people expert in code, uh, memory overflow, pushing things, the hacker of the artificial intelligence are social engineers that convince artificial intelligence to say things that they shouldn't say or do things. And I found a very beautiful, and sorry, I don't want to spin a little topic, but this is very interesting. Um, mm -hmm. A guy that spent his time with the chat GPT, he said, if these things like a human brain, because they don't even know why it's working a certain way. They have an excuse and explanation that doesn't stand on how it, it works. But the truth is, those are synapses, <clears throat> electronic, but it's a brain. Mm -hmm. Now, he says, we have some strange phenomena like remote viewing or the capacity to do something strange. So if humans can do this thing somehow, ChatGPT will be able to do the same thing. So he spent hours to train ChatGPT to do paranormal things with the power of the brain <laughs> and actually came out that some results of the ChatGPT start responding with things that, you know, you couldn't verify, but are, are very, are very peculiar. 
So can you imagine where we're going to go with this power of this uh, AI when they, they reach the, the AGI in a centralized place? When somebody can move the switch of what this thing is going to say or not. <clears throat> if we are affected by what we see in the newsfeed of Facebook, we can be terribly conditioned by a brain that is millions of times more powerful than ours and can manipulate us as it wants. So what? We have been terribly conditioned. Not that we can be, we are conditioned. Yeah, yeah. but we're going to be way, 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 way more. It, it, so it needs to stand very strong with our capacity to say no, <laughs> know how we dominate and we are not, you know, we don't watch advertisement. I don't get affected by advertisement. I want to share a story and then I'll comment. During COVID, in the height of COVID, you have to wear masks and stand six feet apart, <laughs> even though we knew that was BS. I was looking at a picture from the 1930s and there was a crowd. And this was in the time of the NBA bubble. So, you know, the NBA season continued. They had a bubble. They went to Orlando, Florida. No um, fans, spectators were at the games, were just the players, et cetera, et cetera. I was looking at this picture. I didn't this picture. Take it in the 1930s, black and white. Everyone was standing close to each other in a crowd. There were no masks. And a part of me was freaking out. I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Not realizing that I am associating the new normal with having on a mask and standing um, far from each other. So that is why I say that we're being conditioned. Because if you look at how you live today versus 15 years ago or 10 years ago or five years ago, it's not the same. And what's Absolutely. normal now isn't what's normal then. And the only reason why you accept the normal now is because you've been told that this is the normal. I mean, look how many people took the vaccine and they got sick. Well, that's a different topic for another day. Um the question that is not even a question, what I'm hearing is that AI has the potential to revolutionize our life, but it's also centralized. That's the important thing. It's centralized. And like you said, it has been shown to have um, political favorability to different parties that not so kind to other parties and so on. It's also been shown to have a, a wokest agenda. I don't know if people know what that yeah, means. But. Yes, absolutely. I didn't want to say what, but he is incredibly active. He can, he can talk bad about Trump. He cannot say anything bad about somebody else. It is, it's, it's incredible how, uh, you know, mm -hmm. because you are what you eat, they say, right? And uh, what the, yes. the artificial intelligence eat is information that is being fed to. So the responsibility falls there at a certain point. You also, you also reflect the, uh, the population of the world, you know, at the end of the day. So based on what you fit with, if it was above the parts, no, you no, know, no, like... No, no. Stick a pin, stick a pin. Which one came first, the egg or the chicken? Right, that's, that's, yeah. that's exactly so the point. is it we that's influencing air or is it air that's influencing us? Yeah, no, you, you see, the uh, people, there, there was a very beautiful experiment uh, that was done uh, is, is in YouTube, if people want to search for it, uh, where there is uh, uh, about 20 people sitting in the waiting room of a doctor, and there is a secretary next to the door of the doctors, and these 20 people are 20 actors, okay? So the secretary, once every 30 seconds, ring a bell, ping, and everybody stand up, and then sit down again. And at a certain point, the doctor makes one of the actors go in, and one new patient that is not an actor, doesn't know anything, sit with the 19 remaining actors. And sure enough, yeah. ping, everybody stand up, this person is confused, but the next pin is going to stand up as well. And one by one, all the actors are gone, and the 20 people in the waiting room are all the people that have no clue, but they all stand up when the bell goes off. But this is scary. This is fun on one side, but it's scary, but it shows how people is, right? People yeah. do what other people do. And and uh, and then people put the mask and do the vaccine, and not because because what else you do? Everybody is doing yeah. it. You don't want to not comply with the masses, and 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 we as a humans are uh, not very smart. If you want to say because yeah. we don't take the bravery to stand up and say. Maybe not. And those they do are pointed at the finger like crazy, like, you know, conspiracies. So the revolution is, is difficult in, in a world of uh, people that comply, right? Because people that think different are not normal. <laughs> you know? So, so 
they all go in Facebook. Uh, they all get uh, conditioned by things. I mean, myself guilty, you know? I go in Facebook. I did the vaccine. I put the mask <laughs> because I want to live my life in peace, you know, even yeah. though I disagree well, with all these things. Just to get you know? by, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, um, Dr. Roberto Chialdini. Oh, Italian. <laughs> Italian. <laughs> You know Roberto Chialdini, do you? Are you familiar with his work? No, no, I don't, no. Oh, you should read his book. He has two books. One's called Persuasion, and one's okay. the other one's called Persuasion. And it's really about influencing people. In one of his books, I don't remember which of them, it, it does a few things, but the one I want to speak about is that there was an incident where a woman was <laughs> in front of everyone. I cannot okay. say that on the internet. I can't put this on YouTube. I'm going to have to blur that out <laughs> because I'm not okay. used to having a touch of conversation like this. But this, is another, this is another audible thing. Like, uh, what is the free speech in YouTube? It's insane. This thing. But it's anyway, not free at all, it? Is, okay. uh, I tell you. But anyway, this woman was um, inappropriately, um, I even know how to say it, is, was dealt with inappropriately in public. In front of everyone, full view of everyone. And it was an outrage story because they're like, how can people allow this to happen to someone? In another story, someone was, let's just stick, let's just stick to the one, the one uh, outrage. The reason why it was allowed to happen is because they were in public. A lot of people were there. All right. And when it started to happen, she did not look at one specific person, make eye contact and say to that, say to this person, I am in trouble. I need your help. What she did was she tried to be defensive, be quiet. And the person did what he did. The reason why this is important is because in that moment, the crowd is there looking and they see what's happening. But no no leader, no leader stand up to make everybody else move, right? It's not even about being a leader. Well, it's exactly about being a leader, come to think of it. Because everyone is looking at the next person trying to figure out how to react Mm. in this situation. Right. And because nobody is reacting, no one reacts. And when they look at her, hold on. I'm sorry about that. I'm coming down with a cold. So I think I'm going to have to cancel my interview after this one. I'm coming down with a cold. So yeah, where, where are so, you? Yeah. You're in London. Where are you? I'm in Jamaica, actually. You're in Jamaica. Wow. Yeah, I'm okay. Cool. I'm, I'm yeah. some idiot is burning. Um, you, 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 you speak yeah. English quite quite understandable. I, I don't hear Jamaican accent in your in your English, which is good because I wouldn't understand much of what you say. Oh, you think Jamaica so like this? Well, go on, man. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we, don't, we don't sound like that. That is also conditioning. We're going to put it to it. That is also conditioning because right. Jamaicans don't sound like that. I know. <laughs> oh, that's what you hear. I've never been personally, but when it's on television, when you go to New York in Jamaica area of New York, that's what you hear. <laughs> you know what I did? I was watching um, The Little Mermaid. Guys, don't ask how I ended up watching it. There was a girl who was like a little sister. I tried okay. to watch it, I watched it with her. And there was, I think it was a starfish. Okay, it was Jamaican. It was a starfish. It was Jamaican. There was this character that was Jamaican. Mind you, the queen was black. My gosh. I don't, what is it? Anyway, so the starfish was Jamaican, and I couldn't stand his accent, and I'm Jamaican. Okay. Right. So then, <laughs> yeah. So, but, say it's like, like I was saying, like the reason why it happened was because she also didn't look at someone specific. So everyone right. was looking at the next person for the cue on how to react in that situation. Which brings us to the point now, because you said that a lot of people took the vaccine and did the mask thing because everyone was doing it and they wanted to get on with their lives. Well, that's the thing now, because I'm thinking that that is what. Um, centralization versus decentralization is coming down to. It's not that decentralization isn't better and it's safer, but because the masses are owned by centralized organizations, it's not a, something that's talked about enough. Not enough people Absolutely. understand it. And because of that, they're going to continue to go with what's normal. Because if you think about it, how much influence has social media have or had on election outcomes, yeah. just since Elon Musk took over Twitter, social yeah, media, on, <laughs> yeah, he said that, wow, you can't believe that this is how much um, propagation and um, influence the platform, just Twitter alone, has had on the outcome of elections. And do you guys, yourself also, Roberto, do you guys actually think that the governments of the world, the billionaires of the world, are going to have this power, this centralized power, as they put it, 
and um, they're going to give it back to you? It is a matter of uh, shifting. It's not a matter of uh, the power. Holding power, you need to, to manage to keep holding power, right? Uh, look okay. at education. Education is a tool to make people able to think and stand up. So you make sure that nobody is educated above a certain level or just few selected in a certain circles can mm -hmm. access a certain level of, uh, you know, like positions, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the idea of uh, keeping control is done through so many means. Now, think about it. I, I know I look 25 and 50 next year. So uh, when I was a little kid, either you have an encyclopedia at home or you have an uncle that knows well, or you go to school to learn things. Today, the, the, the capacity to learn is just a matter of learning how to learn. Because the information yeah. to learn everything is available yeah, online. Yeah. Schools are not there, shouldn't be there to teach you math. They should be there to teach you how to learn math, to make you want to learn math and to test if you have been learning it. But you should be on your own and with the education that you got in how to approach what you want to learn. So there is the possibility that uh, there is... Uh, a wave of uh, better brains coming up uh, if they detach themselves from TikTok, maybe, <laughs> you know, right? Yeah. If, uh, if people understand, uh, but, you know, there, there is a cycle of, uh, um, you know, being in a bad situation and then, uh, uh, you know, pulling up your sleeves and start working and then uh, getting in wealth and then relaxing too much and go back in the bad situation. And, you know, keep... so we are in this phase where, we are paying for previous generations not doing their job well. And yeah. I think the next generation are going to be the one rebuilding, right? So there is a chance that uh, this is going to be done with much more awareness uh, on things about life. Because if I want to know how to build a boat, I don't need to search somebody expert and hope that he's teaching me and put his time. I, I have millions of videos online in <laughs> building every shape in how to decide. I have the tools that, okay. so the possibilities are, you know, endless. It's just a matter of wanting. And now the wanting is going to come in a certain way because of need. So I think that the direction is this one. Not much people trying to keep control. They're going to try to be controlled, but they're going to lose this battle in front uh, of the people needing to, to be better. Mm -hmm. You're right. You're right. And that also represents a shift in the way we do things. Normally, education was centralized, as you would put it, and now it's starting to become more and more decentralized. And the thing that I'm not certain that we've looked at this enough Right, I'm not saying that we've addressed this point enough, and maybe you want to comment on it. When it comes to centralization, decentralization, when it comes to the power of AI, when it comes to the power of disruptive technology, it is something that offers the grand opportunity to improve our lives for ourselves. And the reason why I say that is because normally you are, what you learn is decided by the government. When you right. go to school, when you go to college, the career that you get into, Believe it or not, guys, growing up, you became what your parents were. So if you're from farmers, you're going to continue being a farmer. There is no breaking out of the slums and becoming no lawyer. You're staying a farmer. Good for you. You were born a farmer. You're staying a farmer. Now, I grew up in the countryside of Jamaica. And here I am on a podcast talking with a distinguished gentleman like yourself. The reason why I bring this forward is because I want you and I, and everyone who is listening and watching, to consider the possibilities of how we can improve not only our lives, but the lives of our future generation. What is it that we can do? And maybe you have answers, maybe you have ideas. What is it that we can do in the sphere, in the acknowledgement of the power of AI and disruptive technology that is going to remove some of the problems that we have to make it a brighter future for tomorrow? Yeah, and I think the only things we cannot change is that we have 24 hours per day, right? We yeah. have some obligation that we need to comply to. We need to cut out the time to give ourselves the chance to make a difference in for ourselves, sure. right? So mm -hmm. just cut up a little bit of time from one side. This time scrolling on the cell phone, it should be the first that is gone. And put the time to educate yourself on something. The tools are all there, all there. 
and then start applying what you learn. You know, that's, that's as simple as it is, you know, and the tools are all there really. ChatGPT, just tell, okay, I'm your student, you're my teacher, teach me how to speak Chinese, I don't know, or teach me how to uh, build electronic uh, devices, or teach me how to, it's as simple as it is. An internet connection, pretty much everybody can access an internet connection, Mm -hmm. a cell phone, an iPad, a small computer, even an old computer, because now the computer power is only for gaming, because everything else is remote. Even gaming actually can be done renting a GPU for remote. (laughs) So a small computer is good enough to do whatever you want. And uh, and that uh, is the opportunity. Think this, when we went to school, one teacher need to follow the average of 15, 20, 30 kids in a class. So the, Mm -hmm. the most intelligent will be terribly bored, and I know because I was. <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the slowest one, it will be in very big difficulty. Now, artificial intelligence can customize the same lesson to all the 40 kids in a 40 different way using what is kids like. You know, a girls like to dance. You can teach math through dance because dancing is music. Music is math. So you can learn something as a means to get to the goal that you have, which is uh, mathematics, which is dancing the case, but learning mathematics. Or you can learn geography. I yeah, like to mm-hmm. dance. Uh, you can teach me how is the dance in different parts of the world and why and which is the weather and which is, you know. So there are means uh, to customize lessons and education for every single kid. And I'm not talking about the future. I'm talking about... Today right is already possible, yet the government already keep doing the same thing they were doing yesterday. There are classes with a lot of kids. They are graded by common tests. It is horrible. So being able to say, okay, I need to do that because my parents want that I do that. But at the same time, I can cut off my time to educate myself in a different way to become better, doing what I like, learning what I want. Mm-hmm. And that gains the freedom you know, in, in increasing the capacity of doing things. So there are millions of opportunity with the technologies that we have today. You're right. And um, this podcast, so the Boardroom Podcast, is a podcast that was started to make business more accessible, knowledge more accessible, because a lot of times businesses fail because they don't know what to do and what not to do. So they make the wrong decisions and so on. I want to put it out there. I want to put the owners and us as entrepreneurs to use this kind of technology because at the start of the episode we're starting about what it takes to make a successful product and products can also be a service offering etc etc use this as an opportunity to improve the life of yourself and of your loved ones yeah by creating something that is going to make something easier maybe you can create um an ai powered learning platform that assesses students based on their strengths, their weaknesses, their learning patterns, and teach them basic math, basic reading. This is something that can even be done for adults. A lot of adults are illiterate. They don't know how to read. They don't know how to write. I also spoke with Dr. Philip Hickman, who uses something like this to teach kids, and his company is taking off. It's doing brilliantly. So I think this is an opportunity for us as entrepreneurs to get out there and do something. Because remember, in entrepreneurship, if you chase money, you don't do well. If you chase making a change and helping others, then you do well. When it comes to something that we should do. And if you want to close the circle, what we're discussing at the the beginning is that when you have an idea for a business before investing too much, uh, check uh, the idea with your family and friends. So now we have one more friend to check the idea with, which is artificial intelligence. So even people that is too shy to ask family and friend, you can have a feedback from artificial intelligence. It's something that can also start making you go through the process of getting something done better. It's incredible, but... uh, Artificial intelligence is intelligent. <laughs> That's where the name goes. <laughs> is is a powerful tool. Do you know uh, Dr. Jordan Peterson? Are you familiar with him? Yes, like, absolutely. Who? I love the guy. I am. Um, yeah, I love him too. He's pretty cool. I saw it posted a tweet. This is interesting. He posted a tweet where he said that um, usually when Chat GPT just came out, it would be like his research assistant. So he's writing a paper, he's doing some work, and he could ask ChatGPT a question and would bring up sources and cite information. It would make his job a lot easier to get his points across and formulate an idea. That is something I think we can also use in our business research. Now, he did also go on to say in a tweet that ChatGPT was getting useless because it's centralized and it's propaganda and all of that. 
But I think that is something that we can also take advantage of in terms of having our business ideas, vetting it by ChatGPT, having an idea and learning how to execute that idea from ChatGPT and other AI platforms because there are other AI platforms. So I think you're right when it comes down to that. And, you know, even going against uh, what we said before, even Facebook is a nice tool to find 100 people to give you a good feedback on an idea in exchange of uh, some other yeah. things, you know, like a free, you know, use or a coffee or Starbucks mm-hmm. or whatever. You know. Anyway, it, it's important to use all these tools using your brain first. Yes. Everything, even other human beings, is important to, you know, deal with them using your brain first. So, mm-hmm. so it's a common uh, good uh, advice, I guess. Yeah, that's true. You don't want to be um, easily colored in one direction or the other. That's true. And if you have a product, if you have a service, if you have a customer, it can be found on Facebook. That's what the jargon in marketing was. <laughs> if you have a product or a service, the customer is on Facebook. That is true. How did you enjoy your time today on the Boardroom Podcast, Robert? Oh, it's been an amazing, an amazing conversation. I'm so thankful for you to have me here. And uh, I'm so gra- grateful that I had to get to know you. It was a wonderful experience, and um, we should um, we should do this again sometime. This was actually pretty fun. Um, right. I can envision this doing pretty well going forward. Sure, and I'm always here. So whenever you want to have a chat, uh, ping me up, and I'm gonna be happy to to contribute to your podcast. Before you go, though, um, can you share with us a little bit more about your podcast and the type of work that you do, just in case someone is listening and they would like to connect with you and get your help. So a bit about your podcast and a bit about the work that sure. you do. All right. But podcast, uh, there are several, but the one that is more prominent uh, is called Breaking Banks Europe. Is the European edition of Breaking Banks. I have a, I am one of the many hosts that are there. There are multiple hosts. I have a series that is called Conquest, where con are the con artists, the scam people, and quest is what we do to chase them. And I interview uh, YouTubers uh, and all people involved in uh, catching those scammers uh, and mm-hmm. educating people not to fall for uh, you know online scam, a phone scam. Uh, you know there are many kind of. Uh, uh, you know, victims uh, of uh, any sort of uh, way to extort money <laughs> to them. So it is a, it is a very interesting uh, set of discussion with people that spend some time, full time, uh, their life in doing this uh, as, a, as a job. And uh, on the other side, there are technologies and, uh, you know, unboxing of gadget. Uh, I am the master of gadget. I must have a uh, $1 million of <laughs> stupid things that nobody needs in this room where I am now. Okay. And, uh, you know, sometimes I review them online and I do these things. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's great. That's great. I uh, thank you for sharing that with us. Um, given that you had such a great time, uh, so I'm going to link those in the description. You can send over the links as well and all of that. And I'll post them in the description and I'll have them come up in a lower third as you speak about them. So anyone who wants to get in contact with you or they want to check out your podcast or your unboxing, they can get, uh, they can have the ability to do that. Uh, given your experience on the Boardroom Podcast today, who is one guest that you would like to see on the podcast in the future? And for this guest, what is one question that you would like us to ask them for you? I would love to see you have a chat with Elon Musk. <laughs> I don't know if this is going to yeah. be ever possible. I wish I do the same. And my question to him is, uh, how how did you make all this possible? I am like uh, above uh, the admiration sometimes. I believe it cannot be even true. Uh, I mean, I I, I, have, I had a 60 employee in a company I ran and I was CEO and I had, uh, you know, difficulties to manage the whole thing. He has thousands in many different companies, CEOs, many different companies. How, mm-hmm. how can he do I So he's humble, humble, sorry, he's sleep on the floor in the production for the Tesla. He's there for SpaceX, for sure. He hired the best people. He went from up to down to up to down several times. Uh, he must have the most incredible things to share and advice for entrepreneurs. So that's really the number one uh, potential uh, guest uh, that uh, some YouTuber managed to have, uh, Rogan <laughs> Peterson himself, I guess. Yes. <laughs> Elon Musk would be a wonderful guest indeed. And I know he would have some very interesting um, opinions on AI decentralization and disruptive technology. I mean, he is in the space, right? Absolutely. So that's um, great. 
Thank you for your time today, Roberta. You've been wonderful. This has been wonderful. Let us have you on again in the future. Sure. And thank you guys also for listening and for watching. Take care. Until next time.